Uh, this is not a lecture about why. I'm not going to talk to you about carrier landings and Top Gun and maneuvering and you know talking with my hands and ended up shooting down my watch every time like that stuff. You know, that's all, what this is all about. Uh, this is about how many people here worked on the base? Just okay, most everybody. This is a project management lecture actually, and all of you who remember all those lectures and courses you took in on the base about how to be a program manager and you know, talk about the process, about the a vision and the requirements and then the options and then decisions. Uh, then you build some, or you buy something, you build it, you test it, and you operate it and you sustain it. That's what this is all about. It really is about program management. And so what I'm going to do specifically, it's, it's a very specialized lecture. So again, if it didn't one you're, you expected, please feel free to leave. Uh, background is I, over a six and a half year period, uh, ending in uh, 2011, April 2011, I built an airplane uh, by myself, a home built airplane, built it in my garage. So this is a story of how I did that. It's not about building techniques. It's not about how you build an airplane. It's just the process I went through in deciding what to build in going from there. A couple things about home built airplanes. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, home built aircraft are certified as experimental by the FAA. Uh, that means that you're pretty much free as a builder to do whatever you want as far as building it, deciding the configuration, what you're going to put into it. Uh, you do all the design, modifications, maintenance, and inspections. Since I'm the builder, I've got a thing called a repairman certificate which means I do all the maintenance on it. In fact, my airplane right now is in 100 pieces in my hangar at Air Inukern for its annual inspection. And I am, nobody else looks at it. I have full inspection authority because it's experimental and I'm the builder. It removes most FAA oversight. And what that means is you're pretty much on your own. The only inspection requirement is after you're, you say it's ready to go, the FAA will come by and do a one-time inspection uh, to make sure that uh, it is, in fact, airworthy. But other than that, you're on your own. So what I want to do with this uh, presentation, it's uh, any by the time anybody has a question, just interrupt me. But it's gonna, not going to take uh, probably less than an hour as we go through this. But I want to uh, explain the process that's involved in determining whether you want to build an airplane and then, you know, what you go through with all the options, all, all the uh, different decisions you gotta make in that process. Like I said, it's not a lesson in airplane building techniques. Uh, you get five airplane builders in a room, you got at least 18 opinions on how to do it. So it's, uh, but if anybody wants to get into that, I'm more than willing to offer my very biased opinions on how it ought to go. It's also not a pitch for business opportunities because an experimental home built airplane, except for a limited pilot proficiency uh, training, you can't use it at all for commercial purposes. In fact, I wanted to offer a, uh, a flight to somebody as far as the museum auction last year. I really went through that and tried, thought I had it made, and the folks at the air, uh, uh, airport reminded me that that was probably illegal, and I actually went into uh, the FAA and uh, asked them questions, and it turns out it is. You cannot use it for any kind of commercial uh, purposes. Okay, if you want to get into this, I mean, again, it's a very specialized undertaking, but you gotta have a dream, you gotta have an attitude. You have to have some idea of your specific requirements. You gotta think you have the time. Uh, usually it's three to five years. Like I said, it took me six and a half years, uh, but I had a real job and I was on the road most of the time. About 2,500 hours of hands-on effort and I was slow and uh, worked alone. I'll talk about my wife's so I might as well get that out of the, uh, on the table right now. Uh, she was very hesitant to help because she thought she'd make a mistake, the wing would fall off and I'd die. And it'll be, all be her fault. So she didn't do much on the thing. Uh, 75 to 130 or more K, depending on what you want. Uh, there are some kits out there, uh, the exotic turboprop powered kits that you can spend over a million bucks. Uh, ultralights, you know, the, the real slow movers, uh, you can get for considerably cheaper, but that's 
there's a lot of things those things don't do. They're just for, pretty much for uh, recreation. Determination, patience, and willingness to persevere because it, uh, it's a long, long process. One of the good things about it, you get about halfway through and you realize you got uh, a lot of money inv invested in this sucker, so you're gonna, that's a pretty much a driver to uh, continue. Uh, you gotta have the ability to learn new skills. When I built this thing, I never had driven a rivet, never worked with fiberglass at all in my life, uh, but you learn stuff. Uh, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to go down the wrong path. Uh, nearly everything is correctable. Uh, and uh, the alt, uh, what you end up doing in a lot of cases is repairing things. And to, if you really screw it up, uh, you just buy a new part uh, from the kit manufacturer. All it is is money. Uh, <laughs> the thing of it is, once you're done, you're going to have an airplane. And there ain't no AAA up there in the air. So if something goes wrong, you're not gonna pull off to the side of the road and call AAA. So you wanna have confidence in your ability that the product that you've, you've made is air airworthy and safe, especially when you start hauling passengers around. Uh, the requirements for a home-built airplane for the first 40 hours, you gotta go solo and you have to fly it in a specific test, test area. It's called phase one testing. So you're pretty sure after 40 hours a thing is going to fly. Okay, uh, FAA. Uh, all you government folks, you know, I worked with the government, I was in the Navy for 30 years, and I'm a defense contractor now. I could probably say without reservation, the FAA is a, probably the hardest federal agency to deal with. I mean, they're, they're proud of the fact that their vision is they're not happy till you're not happy. So it, uh, it really is, uh, I mean, it, and it's fiefdoms. They're arranged by uh, FISDOs flight standards offices all over the country, and they will admit that each FISDO is its own little monarchy and they, the rules aren't consistent among all of them. It's really, you could get re into some real do loops dealing with the FAA. You gotta have space to build it. Uh, if you have a partner, spouse, it's pretty good, you know, they at least have to tolerate it. She tolerated it on this one but she has put her foot down when I said I want to build a second airplane. It's uh, not going over well at all. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, you got to have the right tools. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, and the bottom line, if, for all, all you folks that have done projects at home, you can never, ever have too many tools. So it's uh, always a, uh, it's always a uh, money drain. Those of you who are not pilots or interested in this kind of stuff, may be interested in it, is aviation right for you, flying right for you. It's, uh, it's expensive, but it, you know, I, I can't remember uh, not wanting to fly. It's my youngest, oldest memory. I was always interested in aviation. It's magic up there. But some people, my, my, for instance, my wife will not get in the airplane. She absolutely, my daughter will not get in the airplane. It's for, the grandkids love it, you know, but that's, uh, that's another story. You gotta have a hanger or a way to get a hanger. All of a sudden you end up, this little, these boxes that came in the FedEx or by truck, all of a sudden end up in these big assemblies that you gotta put them somewhere eventually. Okay, what are your personal requirements? If you wanna get into this, you know, the, some of the things, recreation, cross country, family hauler, business, all those things. Uh, acrobatics, uh, my, I, I was a fighter attack guy in the Navy for 30 years, so I'm more comfortable being upside down pulling up G's than I am right side up. So uh, that was one of my requirements is this thing had to be able to do acrobatics. And it's a plus 6G, minus 2G airplane. Uh, VFR, visual flight rules, uh, IFR, instrument flight rules. Big difference in the type of avionics you put in the airplane if you want to go IFR. And any other personal requirement you have. There's uh, Kit Planes Magazine is sort of the Bible on this. I added it up, there's 737 different kits available for sale. Uh, seating options are one to 10. Uh, more people usually equate to more money. Uh, uh, maximum speed from 40 knots to ultralight up to 325 indicated for a, a high-end Lance Air. And realistic price range, 15 is probably real cheap. That's probably a powered parachute to over a million bucks. But, it depends on what you want to do. And it, that, uh, that sometimes, it seems like a simple thing, but sometimes it's really hard because, uh, you know, for instance, I thought I was gonna be one of this IFR airplane to go all these places. 
Well, this is Ridgecrest, for God's sake. There are too many clouds around here. So uh, maintaining IFR proficiency was fairly difficult, so I just go VFR, it works just fine, even though I spent the money to make it IFR capable. Okay, here's what I used in, dec in deciding. And that's my baby there, that's the airplane. The paint scheme is, uh, I got my wings in February of 1967, went to Lemoore and uh, ended up on v in VA-192 and two combat cruises, and that was the paint scheme. Uh, with the NM on the tail is CAG-19, November Mike, it's VA-192. It was sort of, our jets were sort of painted like that, so that's the way I, uh, I painted it. The name of the airplane, every airplane has to have a name. Ours is uh, Lujeru, which stands for Lucas, Jacob, and Robbie, L-U-J-A-R-O. That's my three grandsons, had to be equal, so uh, this is a big deal when I got the airplane painted to make sure that Lujeru is printed on the side of the airplane. Okay, uh, those are the elements I went through in actually making a decision on what I was going to build. Uh, and I'm gonna go through these in, in uh, some in more detail than the others, but the point, sir. Yeah, Paul, when are we on the Tyco? 67, 68. CAG 19, then we shifted to 68, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, 69, I think A7s uh, by, by then, didn't he? Yeah. It's a great ship, great time. But all these are, are things you consider. And again, for all you folks that worked on the base, this ain't rocket science. This is the stuff you go through in making decisions when you're running a project. Okay, this is what I determined that uh, I was going to do. Recreation, I mean, it's, if you're having a bad day, there's nothing like just driving to the airport, open the hanging door, getting in the airplane and going flying, get down Garlock Road and doing loops and barrels and stuff like that. It just, it just <laughs> makes you feel good. Uh, cross country, uh, big deal. Uh, this thing, uh, as we'll get into, it'll go up to 700 miles. Uh, I'll tell you right now that for guys, uh, the most important tool on a 700 mile cross country for, for me is a Gatorade bottle to use the pee in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the endurance of the airplane is a lot greater than us old guy's bladder, so you gotta, you gotta consider that too, uh, uh, cross country stuff. Limited acrobatics, IFR capable, I put parentheses around, reasonable cost and operating expense. Uh, aviation is expensive. It, it, it's just a money sump, but it's great. It's only money. Uh, one thing around here, uh, I love flying in the mountains. Uh, I spend the summer up in the Sierra. So I wanted to have sufficient power for mountain flying, i.e., uh, you know, I'm fairly, fairly experienced at doing it, but you know, the, the problems a lot of folks get into is they, they get into box canyons and don't have enough power to climb out. It's, uh, that's something you always worry about when you're flying in the mountains. You want sufficient strength for flying uh, in the mountains. Uh, if it's windy at in your Kern, it will definitely be windy in the mountains. If it's calm, in your current, it'll probably be bumpy in the mountains. I mean, really smack your head off the top of the canopy, bumpy. Reasonable speed and range. Uh, I cruise uh, 160 uh, a true. Uh, I could go faster, but it's more gas and range. I thought it was up to 700 miles. Maintenance procedures. When you build your own airplane, and, I mean, you could pay somebody to do the maintenance, but one of the reasons you build your own is to do the maintenance yourself. The theory behind the FAA's process is the builder knows, I, knows that airplane better than anybody. I know every bolt, every nut, every washer that went in that thing. And so when it comes time to take it apart and inspect it, I know what it should be. And in a good percentage of the time, I catch mistakes. What engine do you have? I, I'll get into that. I have a whole chart on that. Can I, uh, can I wait a couple of charts? Because that was the big deal. Engine selection was a big deal. Um, proven assembly plans and techniques. Uh, you, know, you can buy just plans uh, and build an airplane from plans where you, you uh, make every part yourself. But I didn't think I had time. I didn't have the energy or the uh, interest to do that. And you want to have a generally understood flight envelope. Uh, I could tell you right now, you know, my airplane stalls at uh, 49 knots clean. Uh, or dirty, 53 knots uh, clean, it'll spin. Uh, you know, it'll, it, I know how it, uh, how it climbs. It'll climb about 700 feet per minute, 1,700 feet per minute out of Inukern. It uh, climbs very well on a hot day. 
you need to know those types of parameters uh, when you start flying something like this. I know, I know the glide angle, the glide speed, if the engine quits, uh, all those things. You know, you have to understand what the capability of the airplane is. Because, you know, the old Bob Hoover, you know, great Bob Hoover, the best acrobat fighter. Some people said he's the best pilot that ever lived. He says the, uh, what you want to do if you get into extremis is you don't want to stall it or depart it. You want to fly as far into the crash as possible under control. So you need to know what that flight envelope is. Okay, then you get into what's it made of. Of those 737 different airplane kits, there are three different types. Metal, which is what mine is, uh, metal construction with some fiberglass. Well understood, riveting, uh, metalwork, standard metalwork. Composite, which is basically plastic and carbon fiber, all that stuff. Pretty exotic, pretty neat, uh, really looks slick. Uh, issues with carbon, or with composite, the layup of uh, carbon fiber, uh, sanding is, is just, you know, you sand, uh, it's not for me. So I decided I didn't want to do that. And then fabric, you know, all airplanes were fabric at one time. It's a tube construction with fabric and dope. Uh, pretty old technology, limited performance. So I, I decided to do a uh, metal airplane. Then you go, how many people? A top airplane here is an RV-10. That's a kit, it handles four people. The middle one's an RV-7, side by side, two people. And the bottom one's an RV-8, like mine, RV-8A, two people. Um, Trish was adamant from day one, she was never going to fly. She actually, when her sister, two sisters were visiting from Australia, they loved it, they wanted to go fly. So she was shamed into getting into it. So he took off, I didn't occur, immediately turned right downwind and landed. So she was airborne for three minutes, and, but at least she could say she was in the airplane will absolutely not go anywhere, won't get close to it. So, I usually fly solo. The most pe uh, the, the folks I fly with most often are my grandsons. And of course, you gotta keep track. It all gotta be equal. equal. Whose turn is it? That type of thing. I mean, just, uh, but that, that's really it. They all enjoy it. Uh, more seats is, is more dollars and greater complexity, uh, less maneuverability and range and cruise speeds are affected. You know, we all screw around with the rules and the regulations. You know, we all, okay, everybody that's ever worked for the government is, you know, fed, uh, fudged the uh, rules and regulations a little bit. But you can't mess with the laws, as in the laws of aerodynamics. I mean, they, they're laws. So, uh, you know, range of crews affected by payload. The greater the weight, the more cost and the more penalty you pay to uh, haul it around. So I decided to build a two-seater. Side by side or tandem. If you look closely at those drawings, the one on the left is a uh, tandem, front back. The one on the right is a side by side. A uh, little bit fatter. Uh, side by side is best for passenger comfort if, uh, and uh, visibility uh, offers greater instrument panel real estate. You, know, you have a bigger instrument panel, you can put more instruments in there. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, so if you're gonna build a tandem, you gotta figure out what kind of instrumentation you really wanna put in the, it, on the panel. If my wife would fly, Trish would have fly, flown, would fly, I would build a side by side just for her. But she didn't, she won't. So, uh, you know, like I said, I was 30 years flying the tactical jets for the Navy, this thing flies, tandem, makes it feel like a fighter. And uh, it's narrow. I flew A4s, if anybody's familiar with what the A4 is, real small cockpit for the Navy. So I swore I could, you know, I had to, actually turn, fit in that thing. And I, I kid with my buddies saying if my shoulder blades didn't touch the canopy rails, I wouldn't know how to fly. So, it, uh, so this thing is a tandem, pretty tight cockpit. Actually, it's bigger than an A4 cockpit though. So I decided to build a tandem. Tail dragger, nose dragger, another big, big decision. Um, the tail draggers are sexy, they look cooler. Uh, there's a constant competition, uh, badgering. Real men fly tail draggers, or you know that's the standard thing. And uh, uh, but nose dragger, nose width, it has to do. Uh, the big difference is with a tail dragger, the CG is behind the wheels, the main wheels. So it tends in a crosswind to swap ends and ground loop. It's very susceptible to that. You they call you have to have what they call happy feet. You got to get on the rudders and really pay attention. Sometimes it doesn't matter. The wind, crosswind is just too great. You're going to end up in the boonies. Uh, Tail, uh, so the nose dragger is much better in, in uh, crosswinds. 
Uh, the insurance companies have recognized that, so the insurance is cheaper for a nose wheel airplane. If you want to do, they had so many accidents and incidents with folks ground looping uh, tail draggers with no, no training, that now in order to uh, get any, any kind of insurance on it, you have to have a tail, tail wheel endorsement, and I'm not sure how many uh, uh, hours that takes. But I had 7,000 flight hours, but no tra tra tail dragger time. Uh, but then the winds at Inukern, uh, even though we have three runways out there, it, it, it's amazing all the different directions the winds can come from. And so I've landed my airplane in 20 knot crosswinds, no problem at all. Uh, you wouldn't do that if you had a tail dragger. So I practical Trump sexy, I decided to build a nose dragger, nose wheel airplane. Okay, kit company. I was going to build a kit. I wasn't going to do uh, uh, plans. There's 342 companies sell home built airplane kits. A lot of these are mom and pop outfits, but the airplanes they, they offer are pretty neat. Vans is by far the largest. There are over 9,000 RVs flying. 9,000 guys have actually completed uh, an RV. Uh, they offer nine different models. Their characteristics are fast cruise, good fuel economy, excellent range, and they're just fun. Uh, some models are acrobatic. They have four side-by-sides and two uh, tandem uh, Kits are offered, quick build kits. They call it quick build, where part of the fuselage and part of the wings are built by, uh, at the factory uh, for extra dollars. I did a, uh, they also have great, great reputation and you know, superb customer service. When you're building this thing, you know, you just, all of a sudden you reach a point where what the hell do I do next? So you pick up the phone and call the factory and they were always helpful. I know sometimes you had, you got the tone of the vo voice, uh, you know, this guy really thinks you're an idiot, but he's actually trying to help you. you know, so. so I decided to build a Vans RV-8A quick build. And like I said, quick build is a relative term. It took me six and a half years. And that's a picture of a quick build kit. And it really doesn't do justice because there's a lot more parts, a lot more stuff that goes into it than uh, that thing. And on the right wing, the bottom part of the wing would be open. Um, but no engine. Um, the canopy, it, it just looks open. I spent nearly a year doing the canopy. So, okay, here we go, the engine. But probably the most critical design or decision you have to make, what do you want to do? And uh, you can buy a regular aircraft engine or experimental aircraft, the FAA doesn't care. You can put any kind of engine in there that you want as long as you take into account the center of gravity uh, considerations and the weight and balance and all that stuff. There's a lot of folks with Corvair and Volkswagen engines in, in airplanes. Some guys actually have radial engines. Uh, if you're into engines, which I'm not, uh, but the guys who are into engines just really go hog wild and uh, uh, do some exotic stuff. Uh, you can get an engine and uh, it can use uh, auto gas. Right now, it's $4.99 a gallon for avgas out of the Incarn. Uh, what is it that, uh, down at Dalbertson's, 350 or something like that. So there's a big difference in the cost of uh, gas. Uh, there are problems though with have gas as far as vapor lock and stuff like that. So you gotta, you gotta understand what you're doing. The normal horsepower range for the RV-8 is 150 to 200 horsepower. Uh, max aircraft RPM is 2,700, for a light coming engine, it's 2,700 RPM. Now your little car out there that you're driving around if you check on the tack when you, you're accelerating, you're up to four or 5,000 RPM, probably. Uh, not so on this. There is a, it's a direct drive from the engine to the propeller for a Lycoming engine. Auto conversions require uh, a, a reduction, uh, a gearbox reduction. So, but greater horsepower equals greater initial cost, weight, uh, operating cost, but give you a better performance. New or used? Uh, there is quite a market for used aircraft engines. Uh, you could buy a, an engine from Lycoming, a certified engine, uh, or you could get, go to an experimental engine provider which uses Lycoming parts, but they, they, uh, they, they sell them as experimental engines. There's a lot of those guys. Uh, carburetor or fuel injected, uh, just, you know, a carburetor, you have to deal with carburetor icing and uh, uh, doesn't go inverted very well. Um, magnetos are electronic ignition. Magnetos have been around forever. Uh, they're, they're magnetic generators. Uh, there's no electrical connections to them. They just spin and provide power to the uh, spark plugs. Electronic ignition is a new whiz-bang thing. Much better fuel economy. 
uh, all electronics. Uh, uh, magnetos use aviation spark plugs that cost, I think, $25 a piece. Um, the electronic ignition uses uh, automobile spark plugs, which you can get out of here at whatever they cost. They're pretty cheap. Horizontal vertical induction, just which way the air comes in, what kind of cowling you're going to have. Constant speed or fixed uh, prop, more weight in dollars for a constant speed prop by far, but greater flexibility and performance. Uh, inverted oil system, you could build an inverted oil system. If you're going to do acrobatics, not regular acrobatics where you keep positive G on the airplane. These are the guys who get upside down and just keep it inverted for negative flight. Uh, decided I didn't need to do that anymore. So uh, you know, I'll pull the hell of it in positive Gs, but I, I don't do a lot of negative G stuff. Alternator, uh, you have to size the alternator to your electrical system. Uh, I mean, you can go crazy on uh, figuring out what kind of electrical capability the airplane has. Uh, then, uh, you know, what happens when everything goes south? If you have an alternator failure on an uh, airplane where you're using GPS and all these magic electronic things, so do you need a backup alternator? Uh, turns out I did. Uh, battery, you think, okay, a battery. I got a battery in the airplane that, uh, there's two types. The one's a bigger, regular, looks like a car battery, weighs a lot. There's this little Odyssey battery that they use in Sea-Doo's uh, and stuff like that that uh, it's good enough. It's been great. Uh, whether you're going to mount it forward or aft seems like an easy decision, but there's, you know, center of gravity, uh, wire runs, uh, uh, weight, accessibility, all kind of things had to enter into the decision process. You know, all these things, you know, you throw them in a, bot, in a pot and you got to decide, you know, what you want. It's sort of like, again, working for the government on a project. Okay, here's what I did on the engine. I, uh, there's a, a company in Canada called Aerosport. They build uh, uh, experimental Lycoming engines. I bought 180 horsepower Lycoming. Uh, it gives sufficient performance. The 200 horsepower weighed about 30 or 40 pounds more. Didn't need it. Uh, use avgas only, horizontal induction. Hartzell constant speed prop. Uh, no inverted oil system, and I went down one mag, I compromised, and one light speed, and the alternator, 40 amp alternator is good enough, it has been good enough. I've never, on my amp meter, I've never seen more than 28 amps, and that's just on start um, and turning things on. And I have a backup 8 amp uh, alternator. I'm out on the vacuum pump fitting, because uh, I don't have a vacuum pump, pump uh, for the instruments anymore. And I mounted the battery up front. Here's where it gets start getting painful. Uh, total cost for the engine, the prop, and ignition systems are probably around thirty-eight thousand dollars. So, you know, once you made that decision, you got that engine sitting in your garage. I mean, you're pretty much committed to doing something. I mean, you're going to either build it or you're going to find somebody to buy it, sir. Well, what kind of factory warranty did Aerosmith? I had two years. Two years from first start, not from when they put it on the bench up in Canada but two years from my first engine start, and they did it on the honor system. They were great. I mean, absolutely great people to work with. Uh, answered any question. I'm not an engine guy. That's the thing I was really leery of, you know, hooking up the engine and making sure all the stuff worked. They really were, were pretty good. How much total time you have on it? 530 hours, yeah, yeah. They only got more, except I managed to rip my quadricep tendon up and down for a while. If it didn't fly and some other stuff. But there's a picture of the motor on the bottom, and there's a top one is just hanging it, and a uh, uh, big exotic process of doing that. But it took a few days, but it, it's worked just fine. Avionics, another one of those money sumps. Uh, because it's experimental, uh, there is stuff out there you wouldn't believe. Uh, when I started flying A4s for the Navy in 1967, I had a one radio, a tack in uh, for uh, of navigation and an IFF, and that was it. Uh, we didn't have any kind of radar or any kind of ILS capability, none of that stuff. Didn't have a backup radio. Um, there's amazing cap capabilities at reasonable cost. It, it's just, uh, I mean, it's truly amazing what you can do. I could do performance on my lower airplane. I could do, you know, if I upgraded my uh, autopilot, I could do a couple of IF, uh, ILS approaches. Just, you could couple all this stuff uh, to your autopilot, it'll fly the airplane all the way down the minimums for you. All, I mean, unthought of stuff. Uh, I get 
tied to uh, an iPad with a thing called ForeFlight, uh, all the digital maps. I don't use paper maps anymore. All the stuff is on your iPad. You put it on your kneeboard. It's just amazing. XM. Anybody do XM, Sirius XM weather? Or not weather, uh, the radio stuff, you know. Well, if you think you're getting ripped off by your radio thing, you ought to try their XM weather they offer for pilots. It's uh, 32 bucks a month. And of course, here in the current, you never, I never go flying when the weather's bad around here. But what it, did, it does, it gives you a depiction on your GPS screen of the weather, of the uh, uh, moisture and thunderstorms, stuff like that. Uh, and I'll get into it. I've gone cross country numerous times, and you know when you see this weather depiction on your GPS, you put it either on the left wing and right right wing, and just go around it. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, Thirty two bucks a month. It's one of those things. I, I don't use it for six months, but when you need it, you need it, and it's great. So, uh, so after many hours of analysis, I decided I wanted a uh, electronic flight information system, and that's the middle thing, big metal uh, display. Uh, middle display there. The one on the left is a GPS. Uh, the stack on the right, uh, two radios, the uh, uh, audio control panel, and the I, uh, uh, IFF or transponder. Uh, the ra top radio is a VOR. Nobody uses VOR anymore. Everybody uses GPS. Uh, dual axis autopilot, the circular, looks like a gyro on the bottom is actually a dual axis autopilot. Uh, it just it flies the thing just great. Uh, you get get up and just hit the button. It'll maintain altitude and maintain direction. And uh, I wanted a uh, engine monitor. Uh, I have four cylinder engine, but I can read the uh, uh, car, uh, cylinder head temperatures, the EGT, exhaust gas temperature on every cylinder, separate display, uh, fuel pressure, uh, oil pressure, oil temperature, uh, fuel flow, uh, voltage and amps are all continuously displayed on this engine monitor. The way I fly it with that uh, EFIS, the uh, electronic flight indicator system, I use a left side, it's a three screen projection, use the left side for the flight instruments, the right side is a movie map with synthetic vision. I mean when I take the runway at Inyokern, you know, there it is. Uh, you look at that, that 4500, there's, there's the runway, a picture of the runway as I take off. It's absolutely amazing. And uh, the bottom projection is the engine monitor. You know, it's the old, uh, and then we have a bitch and Betty, the voice recognition, or voice thing that will tell you, you know, she'll start, you know, oil pressure, oil pressure, you're on takeoff because your oil pressure goes high, and you know, she'll just warn you about stuff. Uh, audio control panel, uh, two radios, so I can control which radio transmits and which one receives. It has all kind of magic stuff. It has good intercom. There's an input for uh, what, iPad, not iPad, iPod. You got the music input. I, uh, so much old school, I fly by myself. I don't need to be listening to music. I need to be flying the airplane. So I've never really hooked up any music into it. There's a timer or uh, various things and G meters because you just need a G meter if you're going to go do that stuff. Actually, I have three G indications in the airplane, a standalone G meter that uh, Timer actually has a G, a G mode, and then the EFIS provides a um, readout of Gs. I mean, I tell everybody, I sort of kid, I say, if you, I have two rules. If you want to go fly my airplane, if you want to go straight and level, you go buy an airline ticket, and if you puke in my back seat, you've got to clean it up. So that's the only two rules. What brand is your EFIS? Uh, advanced Flight System AFS 4500. Uh, it's experimental. You can't buy it on a certified airplane. It's, I mean, it is great. It, it, I bought one of the first ones. And the trouble you have with avionics, I mean, things have gone ex advanced so rapidly. All this capability, the digital world. I mean, look at all what you could do, uh, you know, uh, uh, your iPhone and all that stuff now. Uh, again, you look, I started this thing 10 and a half years ago. And everybody told me, delay your avionics decisions until the last minute. Well. The problem is I had to decide on what the instrument panel configuration was going to be because I had a guy do a laser cut, a uh, water cut of the, the holes for the instrument panel. So I, 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 I wish I would have waited. I could have gotten a lot more capability for the same price, but uh, I didn't. I bought them fairly soon so I could actually design the, the panel. And that is my panel. The 
I did use backup instruments, uh, backup airspeed altimeter and VSI, uh, because back then when these electronic flight systems were coming out, there was some doubt as to their reliability. So I said, heck with it, I'll just put, uh, put these backup instruments in there. And it's funny, uh, in my scan, you know, I just used the backup altimeter, vice the EFIS altimeter, and I, but I'll use the, uh, and the VSI, but I'll use the um, EFIS for airspeed. It's just what you get used to. Everybody has their own way of doing it. Are you using electric flaps? Yeah, I got electric flaps, uh, about 196 knots, or excuse me, 96 knots is the uh, flap speed. Uh, that's another one of those great things. You know, I flew, with, again, flying for the Navy, all these complex airplanes, and so you had to have a flap indicator in there, and, you know, and so I'm talking, so I bought this electric flap indicator to put in the airplane. And the guy up at the Vans aircraft, I'm talking to him, and we were talking about this thing, I couldn't get it to work, and so I said, what do you guys do? He said, well, we're pretty basic, we just look out the window and see where the flaps are, you know, <laughs> which is a hell of a lot better than worrying about all this, uh, where they are. Is that uh, steam gauge kind of presentation? No, it, it's uh, digital. It's digital bars okay. on the bottom. And for everything except the fuel flow, and the fuel flow will be just a number in gallons per hour. Uh, but then it's, it's pretty neat. Uh, the, uh, the four cylinders for the CHTs and the EGT, they're both, there's two readouts on each cylinder for that. And then you go across from that to uh, uh, the fuel pressure, oil pressure, oil temperature in volts and amps, and it's just vertical bars with so red green. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and then, Bitch and Betty will in fact, if they go, you set the limits. You can go into this thing and set it up however you, you want it, where you want the uh, warnings to occur, and you'll get an audio limit if any, any uh, range is exceeded on anything. It's, I mean, it really is amazing, it just uh, that they, they could do that. Uh, that is my front cockpit. Uh, it's uh, pretty neat, actually. I spent a lot of time on human factors. On, you know, you'll notice a lot of my buddies said, "Well, why wow, you, 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 know, you fly with your right hand, and the throttle's on the left? Said, why don't you put the radios up to the left?" Well, I have my GPS on the left, um, and you can do it with your free hand. I said, "Well, I'll be fiddling with the GPS a lot more than I'll be fiddling with the radio." So I, I put them on the right hand side. It just, it works just fine. But everybody has their own way of, of doing this stuff. And that's what I ended up with. There's the, uh, another picture of the, uh, the panel. Yeah, it's pretty neat, and about 29,000 for avionics. And so we're up to, what did I say, 38, 29, plus the cost of the kit. So all of a sudden it's real money. And uh, that's one of the reasons I, could, I'm, you know, I retired from the Navy in 1995. That's one of the reasons I'm, I'm still working, you know. I, I tell everybody, it may look like a 29-year-old stud muffin, but I'm 72 years old, so I could, uh, <laughs> you know, I could go retire. But it's great. Okay, for all you engineer guys, you gotta design your own electrical system. I used a book called Elec uh, uh, Aero Electric Connection, a guy named Bob Knuckles. This is what I actually used to, uh, to put my, uh, my uh, electrical system together. It is complex, but anybody that's ever dealt with something like this, one wire at a time. You know, you just go through and hook up one wire at a time. Uh, three buses, a battery bus, a uh, regular bus, an endurance bus. Uh, all those numbers uh, beside those are the circuit breakers. Every circuit need, excuse me, I don't use circuit breakers, I use fuses. Every circuit needs protection, you're protecting the wire, you're not protecting the box. So you have to size it, you know, you know, what's going on with each individual wire. So uh, those are the fuse sizes. I made a decision to use fuses instead of uh, uh, circuit breakers in the cockpit. The fuses are actually forward, they're not accessible in flight. Uh, I felt that uh, you know, the way I fly the airplane and uh, weather around here, if something goes wrong, the ability to reset a circuit breaker you know, I'm not, I'm not going to diddle, do, fiddle with that. Something caused that circuit breaker to pop, and you know, I'll just leave it all, all, out until uh, I land and then fix it. Uh, so that by using fuses instead of circuit breakers, I saved a lot of weight and a lot of money. And the electrical system, I've not had any problems with it at all. It's been great. 
Uh, what, but you what do you mean? What type of wire? Uh, aviation, I, uh, the whatever. There's several companies that sell aviation wire. It's uh, Tetzel or te uh, what, uh, it's one of them is bad. Teflon wire is bad. The other one's good. Uh, so it's uh, you end up using an awful lot of wire. It, it, but uh, it, and I'll get into uh, you know how you you know, the, the types of parts and stuff you have to use. Okay, right here. Here we go. Um, you need specialized tools. Uh, it, it's metalwork. It's fiberglass. It's aviation stuff. You got to do. And again, you can't have too many tools. That's one of the good things that when. Again, Trish was not into this. She absolutely had no interest, but she understood that I, this is, you know, I threatened her that if I didn't do this, I was going to go buy a Harley for my 18th uh, midlife crisis. And uh, so she thought that this would be better than me buying a Harley, so she accepted it. But, you know, I just told her, yeah, this is sort of true. I didn't lie, you know, but maybe I didn't tell the whole truth. But I said, you, you know, you got to have really high quality tools. This is an airplane. I mean, there's no triple A, you know, this stuff you have. So she understood that I had to spend a few thousand dollars on tools. And I was like a kid in a candy store. You ever go to Sears when you had an unlimited budget? You could buy whatever you want in their tool department. It's great. But anyway, various, but you had to buy some, the, the, the other thing. Um, you got to use air, aircraft grade hardware. The bolts and the nuts and the rivets and all that stuff are aircraft grade. Uh, other stuff, you know, just connectors, eight clamps, uh, some like, you know, the aviation department, Home Depot, or True Value, or the guys, the best ones out there at uh, Inukern. Uh, you know, you can go buy all kind of stuff there. Uh, there's all kind of tool companies that sell builders' tool kits, and that's a picture of one down on the right. Uh, that would have cost probably seventeen, eighteen hundred bucks for all that, but those are specialized uh, tools for building an RV. And again, that's the picture of what the thing looks like. Uh, can't see very much into it, but it's uh, there's a lot of stuff. Avery. Avery, uh, a yeah, I bought my uh, yeah, I bought a I, I I like Avery. They're really good. They're really they're in Texas, and you order stuff from them, it appears you know I uh, you get it the next day, and you have a problem with it, you send it back. But it, uh, Aircraft Spruce provides a thousand page catalog you know, of stuff. All kind of stuff for airplanes. It's just, it's amazing going through something like that. That how often you discover unthought of things that you just cannot possibly live without. You know, and so I was always purchasing specialized tools and materials and stuff. And your FedEx and UPS guys are your new best friends. I mean, they'd show up and you know every every other day it seemed. Okay, here's the. Uh, that's my workshop. That's taking the airplane out to Injukern, and there's the hangar on the right. Down at the bottom, it's a great picture. I just put it. That's my youngest grandson, Robbie. Uh, this was I don't know, eight years ago or so. He was just he was a little kid then. And he was taking naps, so he decided, you know, he'd come out and help me for about five minutes, and then, you know, he'd take his nap inside my airplane, when I, inside the, the as we were building it. And there's Rosie the Riveter, that's Trish, when I could convince her into uh, helping me. But again, I mean, repeatedly, she said she didn't want to do it because she was afraid of making a mistake, the wing would fall off and I'd die. So, and then the one on the right is the day we were moving, that's uh, the youngest one. And there's JJ, that's you, buddy, right there in the back. You know, you know take care of the helpers. You know. Okay, this is a true story. I mean, this, this you'll probably think this is absolute BS, but this is true. And you guys know Russ Bates? Uh, yeah, you, you probably know Russ. Well, when we come up to Ridgecrest, uh, you know, I had a job, but we were just th thinking of moving. Uh, Russ had, was going to get married to uh, Linda Andrews, and she had a ranch out at uh, Indicrim. So Russ was moving out of his house up on gate, uh, up in uh, Treat. Uh, and so we, uh, yeah, I'd known him, and uh, Mike Bidlingmeyer actually arranged it. Say, hey, go see Russ's house. Well, I go in the driveway, and. There, right in front of me, is a 25 by 50 detached workshop. That was all I needed. <laughs> I would have bought the house without even going inside. Trish allows us how we better go inside, just have a look anyway. So uh, we were inside for, I don't know, 20 minutes, and we bought the house. But true story, it, the trouble with that. 
And I told you, it took me six and a half years to build the thing. You know, the house could take care of itself for six and a half years. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, not so. That's one of the reasons she doesn't want me to build another airplane. Uh, workshop tools. You need, you need an air compressor, you gotta use air tools. And drilling uh, sheet metal, uh, you need high speed RPM to get into that, uh, the thin sheet metal to make the coals right. Uh, pneumatic drill, uh, rivet guns, uh, air, air rivet gun, paint gun, uh, that, uh, that kind of stuff. You needed a, uh, a uh, air compressor. Drill press, belt sander, bandsaw, grinding wheel. Uh, the thing I used most often toward the end was just a Dremel cutting tool, a Dremel tool with the uh, rotating blade. Does, that was really, really good. And I had a big cutoff saw that I could cut the bigger parts. But it was uh, pretty reasonable. Then there was a zillion tools that you use one or twice, once or twice during the process. But you know, anybody's worked on a project, when you need a tool, you need a tool. And so, okay, what do you need? Uh, I'll go through the pictures here in a second. Um, you gotta know how to build, do metal work, fiberglass, electrical, painting, power plant skills. And you develop most of those through the process. Plans and blueprints, and I'll show you an example on the next slide, what, the, what it's like. Uh, as you get into the build, the instructions become more and more vague. It's always up to the builder to decide what he wants to do. So you've got to figure out how the electrical system, uh, canopy, uh, firewall forward, all this stuff was sort of, uh, you're pretty much on your own. As like I said, I've never worked drill or uh, rivet or rivet or worked with fiberglass. Uh, EAA, Experimental Aircraft Association, offers a two-day workshop. We took that, uh, or I took that. It was quite valuable. It teaches you how to rivet and other stuff. Specialized builders forums available. It's the internet age. You, there's all these forums, all these people. Trouble is, there's all these people. And I, the thing I said, you know, you put five pilots in a room, you got 18 opinions on how to do stuff. You know, you get a lot of that stuff. You have to sort it out. Uh, airport bums. Uh, Indycarns are a very interesting place. Indycarn Airport. <laughs> some people would even say there's some strange folks that hang out there, but they're great. I mean, it's a, but everybody has an opinion, and it's uh, it all helpful. And some of their opinions are even valid. But. So you have to uh, learn how to remove rivets and correct fiberglass because you're going to make mistakes. So you're always going to make mistakes. You develop the skill sets as you go. And like I said earlier, worst case is you junk apart and just have to order another one. I only had to do that, I think, three times. Twice for the uh, elevator, uh, left uh, elevator, which had the trim tab on it, and I, for some reason, I just couldn't get it right. And then you, of course, you're, you know, the old uh, standard theory is you get a bigger hammer. Well, when you're dealing with aluminum for an airplane, getting a bigger hammer and pounding the hell of it doesn't work sometimes. Uh, FAA rules. FAA says in order to get a uh, get it certified as a home built, you got to do prove that you have done 51% of the work. And that gets, in my case, it didn't matter because I did, you know, all the work. But these P uh, guys that uh, get professional assistance and help and buy partially completed uh, kits, uh, they're even more strict now on the 51% rule. There is professional assistance. Guys make livings out of building these airplanes. Uh, they'll help you, they'll build parts for you, but you gotta pay. And I said the builder community is extensive and really connected. Okay, I'll go through the pictures. The one on the left is uh, when we first, that's the first part you did, was the uh, a horizontal stab. Pretty proud. That one, whoops. This here is the midsection, that's the aft stick. Uh, that's a trim relay, uh, the uh, aileron, uh, wing uh, autopilot uh, servo, and various wires and control cables. You can see it. You know, it's systematic, but there's a lot of stuff in there. I mean, you've got to keep track of what the heck you're doing. Uh, this one is looking aft. That's the uh, uh, strobe light uh, power pack. Uh, there is the uh, elevator autopilot servo and various wires, pitot-static lines from the back of the airplane. There's the canopy. Uh, took a long, long time to fit the canopy and uh, uh, get it right, uh, you know, because you're, by that time you have the fuselage built, so you've got to mold the canopy frame and all the, you know, the windscreen and, and the canopy to that, and uh, that took some time. And the other big thing is those are engine baffles. The way this works, cooling on an air-cooled engine is critical. 
So what you do, you have cowling that fits over that, and the cowling uh, presses against those baffles. So you don't want air just going through the engine. The air has to come over the cylinders and then through down and exit out the bottom of the airplane. You do that by those baffles. And as you can see, uh, they're fairly complex in building and shaping those things. OK, don't expect you to read this, but this is one of 58 blueprints. Uh, this was, the uh, again, the uh, horizontal stabilizer. Uh, if you don't know how to read blueprints and you undertake a project like this, you will very quickly learn how to read blueprints. And you learn very quickly the devil's in the details. I mean, you really need to pay attention because it's all there. I mean, it's really there. But in dealing with rivets, I mean, it, it's holes, it's metal. It, there's not a lot of leeway there to, to move things around. So you've got to get everything measured and everything done correctly. You've got to uh, either countersink or dimple them because of the stress uh, patterns you can induce. Uh, actually, there's all kinds of uh, limitations and direction on how you actually drive a rivet, how, you know, how much goes through, how big the rivet could be, and when do you have a bad rivet. Uh, so it, and how you remove a rivet. Uh, Roundhead, uh, flathead rivets are fairly easy. You have a drill and you can pop it and get it out of there. A roundhead rivet, you've got to be careful because it's hard sometimes to get the drill into the top of that head. But uh, like I said, there's 58 of these suckers. It goes all the way through uh, from this all the way up to uh, the finished product. Okay, painting. Um, most parts are primed during assembly. Uh, you can paint it any way you want as long as, let's see, whoops, I done it. Um, you see right there, you have to have your registration number on the airplane in six inch letters. I had reserved uh, November 192, November Mike, because that was my squadron, my air wing. So that, uh, I had that reserved with the FAA. So, uh, but I learned during this build that I was a really, really lousy painter. I mean, I have no talent at all. Probably don't have the patience. So I paid a guy in Texas to paint the airplane. And there you can see it right before first flight, unpainted, and that's uh, uh, how it came out. And there's the uh, Lujeru on the side of the canopy, the three grandsons' names. So, uh, Was that paint in Texas? Yeah, at uh, Glow. Where? In the Glow, Glow the, all the, they specialize in RVs. It, uh, Roanoke, Texas, the, uh, God, what's the name of the airport? Uh, Grady is the guy's name, he's great. They were just really, really super guys. But it cost, it cost nearly uh, $9,000 to get this thing painted. What kind of painting? painting? Uh, it's his, the, the type he, it's air, uh, not epoxy, but it's aircraft paint. Oh, it, it, not polyurethane, there's another name for it, but it's specialized aircraft paint, it's really neat. Okay. Flight test and flight ops. I told you about the one-time certification by the FAA before you can go fly. My first flight was on April 3rd, 2011. You had to have a 40-hour test program, fly it solo, fly it out of Unicur and Queen Glover, uh, populated areas. My area was from here up to Bishop, over to Beatty, down south, uh, what was the name of that tack end down there, south of Edwards, so it's pretty big. Uh, can't carry any passengers. So I got 530 total hours now. Uh, been to Texas, Idaho, New Mexico, Washington, state of Washington, Pennsylvania three times, Florida. It's a great cross country airplane. Uh, top speed is 207 knots. Uh, I cruise at 160 knots true, uh, 8.5 gallons per hour, and I can get up to 700 miles. I mean, it's always this combination of performance versus economy, and I uh, found that uh, I could go slower and go cheaper, uh, but uh, 8.5 gallons an hour is a reasonable, uh, reasonable performance. Plus six, minus two Gs, likes to go upside down and pull Gs. I mean, it does fly like a fighter. That's the first flight. That's a big, big deal. Uh, um, and it goes through the pre-takeoff, takeoff approach and touchdown. And, uh, yeah, uh, it's a pretty neat feeling. I tell you, if you uh, spend six and a half years doing anything, and you know you go through and you just halfway through, you can never see an end. Yeah, it's never going to end. Never going. You know, you keep you have your list of things to do, and all of a sudden one day, there's nothing on your list. You know, it's done. It's ready to go fly. Yeah, it's it's a pretty neat feeling. 
Okay. Here's some miscellaneous pictures. Uh, that one up the top is a switch panel on the right-hand side. Like I said, I flew A4s in the A4 Navy. Uh, autopilot runaways and trim runaways were very critical. I mean, you could lose control of the airplane if the trim ran away. So I, uh, the first top of the three switches on the right are autopilot disconnect, separate from the autopilot of the panel, and roll trim and elevator trim disconnect. So there was another way of disconnecting the trim. Well, it turns out with this airplane, you can override any kind of runaway with a stick. It, it's not critical at all, but I, I had those switches. Uh, the middle one is a uh, fuel boost pump, electric boost pump to back up the uh, uh, mechanical pump. These two, if I do have an alternator failure, I have an endurance bus with that backup alternator. All I have to do is flip those two switches. I'm in backup electrons. And the, that one there is the uh, pitot heat, which is sort of a sore subject because I went out and tested it today and it didn't work. So I got to figure out what the hell's wrong there. There's a picture of the airplane at the hangar, just about ready to go. That's the engine crane I had to use to uh, get there's the engine on a uh, ready to raise and assemble. This is uh, interesting. Uh, it looks like junk, but that's the left wing. That's the uh, aileron push rod. Uh, the rudders are controlled by cables. The ailerons and elevators are controlled by these push rods hooked to the to the stick. And you can see here these are all the uh, uh, pedostatic lines and wires that come in from the, uh, from the left wing. Uh, I was foolish in thinking that I was going to need disconnects, so if I ever took the wings off, I could disconnect all the stuff. Um, hell's going to freeze over before I take the wings off that damn thing because it's so hard to put them back on. So. It's nice to anodize some spars on your pre-built. Oh, well, yeah, they did it. They're, they're, yeah, it's good. There's the uh, wing tip, um, and it has Wing tip light, I got antennas in there. And here's the uh, wing pants, or wheel pants. Uh, looks fairly simple, but getting that thing aligned and getting it built and getting it to all the fiberglass all fixed was a, was a challenge. This is the uh, elevator, and same thing, the fiberglass tips. Picture of the wheel and the brakes. And that mess is the back of the instrument panel with all the, before I cleaned up the wires. I mean, it was just, the one thing I would do if I could do it over again is how I did the electrical stuff. I would make the wires a lot more logical and be, have them grouped the way I wanted them. Rather than, what I did, I had a basic design. Put the basic in and just started adding wire, uh, wires for lights and other stuff at the end. You end up with all these damn wires in the back of the airplane. Um, and that, those little tubes there, that's the angle of attack. I, I put an angle of attack probe out in the left wing so you have to get that behind the, uh, the uh, instrument panel. And there are the three grandsons after, the, after one of the flights. So anybody have any questions? Anything you want to? I appreciate you all staying. I'm sure some of you, <laughs> I'm sure some of you didn't understand a word I said, but I appreciate you being here. Yeah, so. What did you say the VNE was on the 207, 206, somewhere around there. Yeah, it's not. It'll, it'll go. Yeah, it's, uh, okay. I, uh, the danger is, Flutter. Uh, that, that's a, it's basically a flutter limit. Uh, I mean, the thing is so clean, and I've, I've done this several times. You know, I like to fly over the mountains. You know, I'll come over Shepherd Pass or over Kearsarge Pass and point the nose down back into the Owens Valley. And you've got to be careful because the thing will just get away from you. It'll just accelerate like crazy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you just want to make sure that you, you stay within the, uh, the limits. Any other questions? Is, is there a consideration of the wing over the canopy as opposed to the wing? Oh yeah, you could buy, depending on what you want. The, like Cessnas, there are high wing airplanes. And there's room, you know, you, it, with that type of stuff, you have the weight be out beneath the wing, it's a lot more stable. Uh, visibility is a little, sort of limited. Uh, this thing with the wing below you, is uh, you've got great viz, and like I said, it flies like a fighter. It's much more maneuverable than a, a Cessna. Uh, How much fuel? 42 gallons. And that's always a, uh, you know, I'll burn them down to, uh, oh, I got about uh, eight gallons left in the tanks, and so now I'll refuel it. And uh, it's always a uh, fairly unpleasant experience to get the uh, bill, but you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a price you pay. Any other questions? How long did I take? Exactly an hour. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate yeah. it.
Obviously, I'm, uh, I'm pretty passionate and pretty biased about this thing. This is my baby. And as Trish calls it, my blooming airplane. You know? <laughs> Very good. Thank, Thank you. you sir.